So what I'm going to talk to you about is the adoption, compliance, and uh, governance of free and open source software. Um, I had a bit of an issue when, when Andrew asked me to do this. I had a bit of an issue figuring out how to do that because I consider them all as very, very tightly uh, integrated into each other, uh, which didn't used to be the case uh, years ago, at least not from the corporate side of view. But um, since we have to start somewhere, we're going to start with FOSS adoption because this is usually where, the, where people start time-wise. So first they either figure out, oh, we totally want to use that piece of software, or uh, they figure out, oh, we're suddenly using some free and open source software. Uh, what do we do about it? So first question, obviously, why you should do that. Um, since this is an uh, open for business event, I consider you guys to be at least FOSS curious. Um, so I'll but, but it's still, sometimes it's nice to at least uh, check the basics. So the basic idea of free and open source software is that you're able to use, study, share, and improve the software that you get, and that, you enable, that everybody's able to do that. Um, there's some specific uh, additional reasons why businesses would like to do that. Um, one of this is, of course, that you're flexible to use stuff instead of reinventing the wheel all the time, um, which also down usually lowers the total cost of development. Um, one interesting point is also that you're you mostly, if you're not doing it wrong, you can do it wrong, of course, but then you can also buy wrong software as well. Um, you would try to, <coughs> buy, to use tried and tested technology. So one example that pops up um, could be OpenSSL. Um, we all probably remember Heartbleed. Um, that, on one hand, was a technological failure, but uh, in my eyes, it was actually more of a governance failure, because the, the fix, once, it once the problem was identified, the fix was relatively soon uh, produced and replicated. But the problem was with the governance, because many, many companies and many businesses used it, um, they just never or very rarely um, pushed back their, their um, upgrades and their fixes. Um, there's, some, there's some other things like that enables local business because the license fees potentially stay in the country because you can get somebody else to work on it instead of always relying on international big, big wigs. Um, and what's especially interested, m interesting maybe for, from the academia point of view, it increases the local high-tech skills because kids can learn, and many, many, many kids nowadays actually learn how to program using free and open source software and open hardware instead of just going to courses. Um, a specific aspect pertaining to copyleft so GPL and similar licenses, is that it can potentially, if you do it right, uh, protect your investment. Um, so I used this interesting graph. I first used it in Korea, and there people liked it. So I hope you guys like it as well. Um, so imagine that the greenish square over there is uh, your company. So of course, you invest some code or invest some bug fixes or whatever into the community that's using it. So for let's say that you're using, let, 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 let's, let's say for example the Linux kernel, that's, a, that's an easy one. Um, you have a device that you would want to run Linux, um, you have to provide drivers. One option would be that you just, just produce binary drivers or get a shim around it so it's legal. Or you could just try to, to, use the, to push the code upstream into the Linux kernel. So if you do that, I mean, you would, it would cost you some time and money and effort to get the code in. But then you would also benefit from everybody else working on the same piece of code. Because if everybody puts some small parts in, it aggregates and you get more out of it than you put in. It might not show initially, but eventually it will. Um, so the quite real question in 2006 is probably not why, but why not? I mean, all the cool kids are doing it. We, 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 for the past few years, we talked about HP doing it, Intel doing it, ARM doing it, 
Nowadays, we can say Microsoft kind of does it. We're not exactly sure how, but at least they claim so. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the hell is obviously freezing over. If you're not doing it by now, you're not just not with the cool kids anymore. It's past the cool kids already. <laughs> so the, one of the answers usually wha of why not is because you have to comply with the license. And that's a pain in the ass. Um, so license compliance is actually cons the bare minimum you have to do to legally be able to use the software. Because software, unless it has a license attached to it, is full copyright, which means that you have to, you, you're not allowed to do more or less anything. There's, there's few things you can do under copyright law with software you legally obtain. Also question how you legally obtain software without a license, but let's, let, let, let's forget that detail. Um, so it's a trade-off. So you have to comply with the license in order to actually use it. Uh, failure to comply results in a copyright infringement which can have bad consequences, for example, pre uh, preventing you from using the code ever, ever again, um, specifically under GPLv2, for example. Um, which is one of the reasons why some lawyers advise actively against using copyleft, because the copyright infringement bit is a re reasonable risk. Um, there's several building blocks. Before you come to the stage of compliance, you first have to figure out where the, ca where the code came from. You'd have to do that more or less for any code that shows up at your door anyway. But it's surprising how few companies actually question where the code came from, even bef uh, especially before open source started happening. Then you have to figure out what ch which licenses are actually in there, understand them, of course, after which you can finally comply with the terms. So code provenance is, uh, yeah, who wrote what? So you have a whopping huge repository of code um, there's going to be people who just pulled in from code from somewhere. There's going to be there's going to be some dependencies, some libraries. There's going to be some cool project that you want to reuse. Um, there's going to be some code you wrote yourself or your colleagues. Um, but you have to figure out, from the legal point of view, you have to figure out who the authors and copyright holders are, um, because those are the relevant people in question regarding licensing, regarding copyright infringement, or copyright. In in general, um, because you have to get permission from them to use the code in the first place. This, surprisingly, people, people most of the time don't think about that, but this is the most difficult step uh, still, because figuring out who wrote what, even in the days when we have Git and Git Blame and all those tools, it's still relatively tough, um, but it's improving. There's there's tools like Joa and C Regit um, that analyze Java and C, especially in Git, um, on a token level. Um, you, I'm going to then later on distribute the slides. These are actually clickable, so you actually the, the project page opens up. Um, so those help quite a bit. Um, it's still not perfect, but that's, those two are more or less state of the art as we have it. Um, all, the, all the tools that I will mention in the slides um, are open source tools, so you can simply install it for yourself and use it in your, inside your company or inside your project or whatever. Um, the OSGEO um, example is interesting because they have a manual uh, code review process, which before Joe and C Regit was still the norm. So it's still, at the moment, that's still more or less the norm but more and more automation is happening in this, in this regard. So once we figure out who the authors are, we can, also, we can finally check which code is under which license. Um, here, I divide, here I make the distinction between claimed, uh, claimed licenses and actual, actual licenses. So usually what most, most commercial tools do is just scan what it says in the licensing or copyright uh, on copying files or what it states in the documentation. Um, 
there's tons of research, and I know this is a weasel word, but there's tons of research, actual research done, that uh, figured out that what is actually claimed in the license files or copying files may not be what is actually um, even claimed inside the code headers. Um, and even after that, you still have to have a specialist interpret the licenses um, because you, it can happen that you have in the same tree, you're going to have several files of code, obviously. And it can be that one file will be diff under a different license than the, the second one and the third one. And then you have to have a specialist who understands uh, what the licenses mean and how they interact. And potentially, depending on some of the, some of the licenses, even how the software interacts with itself. So for example, if you have um, some code in the, in the package that is under an MIT license and some code that's under a GPL, whichever version, um, it will likely happen that you will only be able to, um, to ship it as an outbound license under the, under the GPL as a whole, um, depending on how it interacts. On the other hand, you can get into even bigger trouble by, for example, if a piece of code that intimately interacts with a GPL piece of code is licensed under, for example, CDDL, because that, those two are incompatible, so you're not able to ship it at all. Because you would, in, the, in, in any case, you would either violate the CDDL or you would violate the GPL. So you're not allowed to. Um, there's, thankfully, there's really good tooling for this already. Um, the open source tooling is really good. Um, from those three, if, you, if there's one tool you have to remember from this talk, it's Fossology. It's becoming more and more the industry standard. Um, it's easy enough for lawyers to use, so I'm pretty sure you guys will figure it out. <laughs> so once you figure out what licenses uh, are applicable, you have to comply with that. Um, that. In some cases, this means that you will have to list the whole uh, in, mo in all cases, it will, pro it will mean that you will have to list all the authors and copyright holders. Uh, in most cases, it will mean that you will also have to, li to list the whole licenses in the documentation. So if you're shipping hardware devices, you have to figure out how you're going to present that. Um, it may also influence how you may license your own work. So if um, you use FOSS components in a bigger, in a bigger set of of code that you wrote yourself, um, it may or may not influence what you can do with your code. Um, there's some, here, here I list some really interesting, um, already very much becoming standard. So SPDX is an interesting thing that's um, a standard on how you, how you list uh, information on authorship and, um, and licenses of software. Um, out of the box, it comes with open source licenses, um, but you can extend it also with proprietary uh, EULAs or whatever licenses you have. Um, it also includes, apart from the standard, it, it standardizes names for uh, the common open source licenses, but it also has its own format. And in, in the next versions, uh, what's, what uh, they hope to achieve, especially through the open chain, uh, project later on is to make sure that the part that together with the source code there's going to be a package uh, describing an XML or whatever there's going to be in the future um, package uh, that will explain on a very very uh, fine-grained way who owns what and what license those are under and with further on with tooling um, that's being built uh, there's going to be potentially soon automation that if you get, if you pull in code, you would also be able to pull in the licensing information and you could deduct already from that. Because currently what happens is that every, every company for itself does the scanning and analysis in-house for themselves. Um, we're not there yet, but OpenChain is a project um, where they standardize on best practices and the main aim is that they try to figure out how to make a supply chain standard 
that if you comply with it, um, your, your clients will be able to say, okay, I, if you comply with open chain, I know that I can trust what you give me is exactly what it says in your SPDX files. And I can just reuse that and then ship it to my client and so on and so on. So not, you don't have to repeat the whole step ever, over and over again. Um, Copylab.org is a very lengthy uh, compliance guide and tutorial. Uh, it's specific to GPL, but on that topic, it's one of the best sources out there. Um, open compliance program is somewhere you can find a lot of links um, that's uh, mended by the Linux Foundation. And OSCAD is really useful if you're, um, when you're really using some code is that because um, the Deutsche Telekom and um, how are they called again? Amadeus uh, wrote together, together the OSCAD chooser, which is you can al it's also free software, so you can also install it yourself and modify it, but you can also just use their instance. You basically you just click through what the situation is you're in. So what kind of an application are you using? Is it an application? Is it a server side? Is it just a snippet of code? Which license it's under and so on. So it has like probably I think like a dozen, not more than that, uh, choices that you have to make, and then it tells you what your situation is and how you should how you should proceed. It's not perfect. It doesn't have all the licenses av available, but it covers at least the most popular ones um, on the business side. Um, there's some usual problems where 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 things fail, of course. Um, just my my favorite is when when uh, you start reading, I'm not a lawyer, but because usually that means it's followed by really inaccurate advice, which cannot be advice at all because they're not a lawyer. But <laughs> um, <coughs> So one of the problems is that developers think they understand licenses. Um, not all of them claim they do, but even the ones they do, there's a very, 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 very small percent percentage of, of, of engineers that actually understand how licensing works. Um, truth be told, most of the lawyers don't understand the technology either, so that's fair. But you have to think when, when you're, if you're relying on an engineer to provide you uh, to provide your licensing advice, you would most probably not let your usability expert or your lawyer um, to set up uh, your security critical network, would you? So think in that direction. Um, so it's even worse is that developers are pretty certain that they know what's in their source code tree, which is almost always wrong. Um, it can be that either they really don't know and they don't, they don't know they know, they don't know, or they are afraid to admit what's in there. Um, but um, that's the reason why we have licensing scanners and provenance scanners. Uh, and it almost always shows that there's stuff in there that people didn't anticipate. Um, it's not always the fault of the developer you're asking or the project manager. Um, it can be that it's just a supplier of a supplier of a supplier that you use, that they had an intern who didn't know what they're doing and they just copy pasted something or they outsourced to somewhere, to a startup most likely. Um, because startups usually just mix and match whatever they find on the internet. Um, there's also another problem that I see often, and but this one is luckily slowly getting away, is that you have overzealous lawyers um, who, as soon as they see something that's stated GPL, or in some cases, even if it just says free software or open source, they start screaming, oh, that's a huge risk. Um, there's two issues with that. One issue is obviously that you're using a lawyer who doesn't understand how open source works. The other one is, yes, it's the lawyer's job to point out the risks, but it's the management's uh, job to manage the risks and make mis risk decisions, which brings us to governance, because risk management is obviously part of governance. Um, and here I, uh, on this, 
on this slide, I'd like to, to, to quote a friend of mine, um, B. Del Garby. He used to be the CTO of Hewlett Packard. And we, we were at, uh, what was that, like three, four years ago? We were at the FOSS Business Conference in Korea. And there was this gentleman from the audience who asked um, something, some specifics on how to avoid the GPL kicking in in a very, very specific um, case. Um, and I remember Beadle's answer because it was very spot on. He said that, well, the problem is what you're looking at is risk analysis. What you have to figure out is what the business risk is. So if you, if you have a product and you know that if you will have to release the source code to the product that the consequences for your business will be that your business will go belly up then don't go near free software open source with that product period because there's a risk if the risk is well it's gonna hurt us but it's not gonna act actually kill us then make an educated decision whether you how close how, how much uh, you want to interact with open source. Um, it just plainly shows that it's a risk analysis and it's a business decision and, well, in some cases, things will just go wrong. Whether the problem is that licensing is also not 100% sure. I mean, if it comes, what, when push comes to shove, this thing goes to court and then you inevitably are waiting for the court to decide. As we saw recently with a uh, GPL uh, court case in Germany. Sometimes courts can make really weird decisions uh, which you didn't anticipate. Um, so, I mean, going to court is a risk by itself. So that's what you have to calculate in here as well. <coughs> so, um, governance consists of policies, processes, and decisions regarding open source. Um, and if we started with mere compliance or with adoption, um, this is the point where you try to go beyond um, and try to reach out to the community in general, which totally makes sense from my point of view, because um, collaboration brings up more possibilities. And it can also, if you're an employer, it can also bring you together with potential uh, expertise um, and employees. Um, again, I remember uh, Bezel at some point and when I we were talking is um, he explained to me when, when was it that HP figured out um, that they have to change their views on uh, how they deal with free and open soft, uh, so software. And he said that it changed when they started, when they got convinced that FOSS is their critical supplier. And he said that had, that was his main argument to the management uh, was that I mean, how the, the, the point is, how do you deal with a critical supplier? I mean, you go out of the way to make them feel comfortable to work with you. And if you, to, to, you, you invite them to coffee, you invite them to lunch, you, you, you know, reorganize your schedule just to make them happy. Um, and that's not something that they were doing. And it's still not something that many, com that many companies do with, with, uh, with FOSS. Um, and which was also inevitably the reason why Heartbleed came to be, is because many companies already had the fixes to Heartbleed. It's just that nobody pushed it to open SSL. And if they did, many other companies didn't need to reinvent the wheel and we would have a very much more safe net. Um, so if you figure out that, that certain components that you use are critical software to you or critical, uh, critically important for your, for your company, uh, you should treat those communities as such. So you should treat them e as equals, you should talk to them, you should try to figure out what they want, and also try to engage them so they accommodate your needs as well. Um, <coughs> so some, if we touch upon some best practices when it comes to governance, um, I'm a lawyer, so we're gonna start with licensing. Um, one thing I really want you to remember is that you should not write new licenses whatever your lawyer says. <laughs> Seriously. There's already way too many of them as they are, and even most of them are crap. 
So just stick to the most known ones because there, there's several reasons. One of them is that they've been around for the longest, they've been discussed the longest, so people, especially lawyers, will already understand them and also the engineers will be familiar with them. Um, the other one is that those are also the, the, the licenses that were, some of them were already tested in court. And that brings a lot more clarity in the, in the relationship you have with the rest of the community or with your potential clients. Um, also, it would be really nice if you would use SPDX names. You can just check the website later on. Yep. Sorry? Yes, they have a list. If you go on the spdx.org website, they have a list of all the names. Um, of all the names. So they're, 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 they're really practical because most of the scanners will find them easier that way. Um, and as I said, it's becoming the new industry norm. Um, if possible, also use the SPDX format and the other tools that they use, but just using the short, the short SPDX names for the licenses would be super. Um, and also, when, you s when you're deciding on your licenses, um, try to see what are the standards in your community. So if the community is more in the MIT BSD type of, li of licensing, if you're going to go full copy left on them, they're probably not going to help you much, and vice versa. Um, also, try to upstream as much as code as possible. I mean, if you have to release it under a free license anyway, if you can manage to get it upstream, so to the, to, to the project that originally wrote the code, you can offload much of the work onto them, especially when it comes to uh, maintenance and to bug reports. Um, it's very useful that if other people do bug reports for you, and also eventually, if they really like you, they'll also send you bug fixes. Um, can save you a ton of money if you do it right. So, which comes back to um, managing the community. Um, a really good trick is that you allow or even encourage uh, one or more of your employees to actively interact with the community or maybe even integrate into them. Um, if you have somebody um, in the community that people trust, and this is an important lesson that many didn't learn before, is people trust people, they don't trust companies. So there is, of course, the business risk that that person will move to a different company. But then again, um, if people in the community f find out, see that you trust people enough for them to interact with the wider community, you will get another expert at some point who will be just as trusted by the same community and continue working for you. Um, also, it's super useful if you're open and follow up on feedback they give and also give feedback to the community itself. So if you find a bug in the software that you're using, please send it to them, preferably with what you want, uh, a suggestion how to fix it. Um, so the main gist is don't just work, try to at least work together with the community, ideally be part of the community. And that's it from my side.